morning. Uh, if you have to say good morning or greet your name, why don't you turn to do so at this time?
get to praise his name every day. I love that. I love that. Thank you. 
situations and have our own problems, dear Lord. We pray, Father God, that you that you would nurture us, dear Lord, that you would caress us, that you would be with us. That, that person that's here this morning, dear Lord, as they hear your word, that that word would soften our heart, that they may turn their lives over to you, Father God, that they may receive the word of themselves, that you may be Lord of their life, that their lives may be changed from this day forward. Bless us now as we come into the service, dear Lord. Be with us. Be God in the records, dear Lord. Take these offerings, dear Lord, and we further your kingdom. That they would be used, dear Lord, to, to strengthen us, that we make a life and take your word to the streets, dear Father. That each and every person that we meet, each and every day, they would see you in us, dear Lord, in our ways, in our thoughts, in our, our actions, our words. That they may want to be a part of that. Bless us now, in Jesus' name. Amen. That was taking this morning's offering. Let's go for
Nice team. Sound guys for allowing us to join together to worship our Lord Jesus Christ. And good morning. My name is Trey Cates, and I'm half the church family and staff here. Uh, welcome. Glad you got here. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, some of you know who I am, some of you don't. Just to kind of give you a little introduction to myself. Um, about 18 years ago or so, um, we, uh, my wife Robin and I were uh, part of this church that was getting started. Uh, back when Farley Community Church was Farley Trailers over by Farley Elementary, right? Is that how it was? No, and trailers here and stuff. And uh, uh, just a Kind of legal history. My, uh, Robin is the daughter of David Blakely, who is the founding pastor of the church. And uh, I got to tell people that I'm married into the family and I've gotten better into the deal. And uh, I'll tell you what, I've been blessed to be a part of that. So uh, for, for me being here today as part of a homecoming, uh, of course, we joined the church last week. And what well, you guys have some pretty strict standards. You make people join the church and preach next week. I don't know how that works. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, you might want to look at how that works for your membership policy. Um, anyway, uh, no, it, it's been a, it was a pleasure to be a part of this church as it was just getting started. And so many uh, families that have welcomed us back. And, uh, Mike and Connie were here, and the Dunlap family, the Russell family, the Callaway family, uh, so many of the writings. Uh, we were just an important part of who we were just getting started off in our marriage and our ministry. And uh, for the last eight years, we've been serving in Vermont as part of your uh, church planning family through the North American Mission Board. So we've been uh, up there, we planted a church in the town of Northfield. And uh, back in December, uh, God uh, gave us the opportunity to start praying about uh, being a part of what uh, Billy and Simon Dunlap are doing at the Vision Ministry. Uh, Vision, uh, this is a picture I'm going to put up there. Uh, the Vision is a, uh, about 300 acres or so that Billy and Simon have developed into a camp and conference and retreat center uh, that they've opened up uh, for churches to use to come and retreat and get away and refresh and refocus and renew their relationship with God. And then, at the same time, they're bringing groups in. Uh, one of the joys that we have is to use the, the, the facility as an outreach. This is a group of orphans from the Ukraine that were here uh, just a few weeks ago with the ministry called Grace in the Ukraine. And so they came up to Huntsville for a few days. Uh, they went and saw the Space and Rocket Center, and we hosted them out there and uh, got to enjoy fellowship and basically showing them that uh, even though they're orphans and they don't have a, a human family, uh, that in Christ they have a spiritual family that they can know their Heavenly Father. And so, uh, that's one of the reasons that we moved back to Huntsville. And we moved here, uh, and we're saying, hey, well, we're going to go to church. And uh, why not talk about it? And for the last eight years, you guys have been our family away from home. You've been praying for us and supporting us. And we just knew that uh, coming back here, we were going to need a church body and we need a church family that we can be encouraged by. So uh, thank you for letting us be a part of that. Um, about Rachel and also our son Joshua, who's over with the, the kids in the nursery. Well, this morning I want to uh, draw your attention to the, the book of Ephesians chapter 1. So if you open up your Bibles with me, Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, last week, Brother Matt, uh, you and Brother Mike, so he brought us a message uh, from Ephesians, really that, that encouraged us to make Christ the center of everything that we are. Now, when Jesus Christ is the center of our lives, it changes everything. The way we love our families, the way we do business, the way we interact with our coworkers, the way we interact at school. That Christ... For us as Christians, if you're a Christian here today, Christ should be the center of everything you do, and ultimately everything you do is designed to bring glory to Him as an individual, but even uh, more importantly, as a gathering of believers here today. We are the, the body of Christ, the gathering of Christ. And so let me just encourage you to just kind of make you, uh, you start thinking about Christ as the head of what we are looking at right now this morning, the body of Christ. Uh, read with me right now, Ephesians chapter 1. I'm going to start at verse 15. The Apostle Paul is encouraging the church. He says, Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and of your love for the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you in the spirit, give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. That the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heaven, uh, at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality, power, and might, and dominion, and every name in his name, not only in this age, but also in the age that is to come. And he put, God put all things under his, Jesus' feet, and gave him to be head 
over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. The last week we encouraged that as we worship God, as we look to bring attention to God, it's about us keeping our eyes on Jesus and making him the center of everything we do. And that message is important to us today as it was to the people living in Ephesus and the surrounding communities of that time. Uh, Ephesus was a place where if you wanted to make money, go to Ephesus. It was the, the, the hub of trade and commercial, uh, commercialism in the Roman Empire. If you wanted to get good, make a good job and make a good profit, go to Ephesus. If you wanted to have a good time and have lots of fun, well, go to Ephesus. Ephesus was the center of the temple worship of goddess Diana. And so if you wanted to go and enjoy all the temple prostitution, all the cultic rituals that surround that environment, that lifestyle, go to Ephesus. And then, if you think about it, you have to be a Christian there, right? Wow, thinking about trying to be a Christian in a world that is so full of itself, so materialistic, so sexually saturated, so focused on bringing glory to themselves, man, it's hard to believe how they survive in that culture. And friends, guess what? That's you and I. That's what we're doing. What we have to live with. And so this morning, the Apostle Paul is encouraging them just like he encourages us. He says, listen, I want to see you how, I want to show you how awesome Jesus is and the power that he provides the believers so that you will stay strong as a church in these days to come. No matter what's going on in the world, those who are the body of Christ are strong and secure. So no matter what happens as believers in Jesus Christ, keep your eyes on him. And so that's what we're going to see about today in Ephesians chapter 5. Turn, turn with me a couple pages. How do we, as the body of Christ, take all the glory and all the attention that the world typically wants to point towards us and that the human temptations are to be directed towards us because, you know, let's face it, it's all about us, right, in this day that we live in. How do we take the temptation that we would have and face to point all the attention to us and how do we turn that glory and attention towards Jesus Christ? Read with me now Ephesians chapter 5. I'm going to start in verse 15. Look what the Apostle Paul says. See then that you walk circumspectly not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody, melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. And then he goes on, he says, Why submit to your own husbands as to the Lord? For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so that, so that wives can, to their own husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. And then he quotes Genesis. He says, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, and should be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And he says this, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you that in this mystery of marriage, in this mystery of living together as the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, God, that there is hope for us, God, because we know that when we operate as your body and we operate as your bride, and we get the attention to focus off of ourselves, we give you room to work in our lives. God, I know that I am tempted so many times to make life about me, life about what I want, what makes me happy. And God, I pray that as you speak to our hearts this morning through your word, that you show us, God, that it's all about you. God, please give me wisdom, Lord. I need your words to speak, not my own. So I, I humbly ask that you encourage my brothers and sisters here the message that you have for us here today. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Uh, Larry, I'm going to ask you to come up real quick. I asked Larry to help me with something this morning. Um, he's going to bring something up here on stage. And just, you can just stand right here if you don't mind. Yeah. Now, Larry, let me ask you a question. What is this? Wedding dress. It's a wedding dress, right? All the women are just going, oh. 
Now, what I want you to do is a room right over there. And you can just go slip in that and zip some. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> Ephesians chapter 5, how we can bring 
glory to our groom. Number one is this. We bring glory to the groom by being filled with the Spirit. We bring glory to the groom by being Spirit-filled. Look what it says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. He says this. Do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, the word on the street is, is when you get drunk, uh, you get... You lose control of your body. You surrender control of your body, your mind, your senses to the effect of alcohol. Think about drugs. That's what you do. You say, okay, I don't, can't handle life. I want to party. I want to disconnect. And so I surrender my body. I surrender myself to the effects of whatever drug I choose to put into my body. And here the Apostle Paul is saying to us, just like the temptation would be in a, in a me-centered society to disconnect and let these other things consume you, Paul said, listen, surrender control of your life to the Holy Spirit. And what's awesome is you look at here, the, the, the Greek word for being filled with the Spirit uh, is the Greek word plero. It's not the same type of filling that you'll see in Acts. You know, we look at uh, like Pentecost and, and Acts chapter 2 when the, the apostles were gathered. And without any control of their own miraculously, the Holy Spirit came upon them. They testified to the goodness of God in miraculous languages. They did amazing things that were designed to bring glory and attention to the church. Uh, and to Christ, here we see this command. Christians, not optional, be filled with the Spirit. And the only way we can become a church that is pure and radiant for our, our room is when the people that make up the body of the bride are being made pure and radiant from the inside out. And so Apostle Paul said, listen, it's not optional. Voluntarily surrender your, your rights to yourself to the Holy Spirit so that you can be pure and open to, the, to what God is doing in your life. And this is the only way when we're letting Christ invade our life and the Spirit invade our life where we say, God, you can call the shots. And it's the only way we'll ever gain the wisdom that he talks about in verse 15 through 17 and the only way we can enjoy the power of God leading us in holiness. Paul mentions this in Romans 15 and 13. He says this, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. How do we do this, friends? We have to stay surrendered to what God wants to do in our lives. We have to say, instead of taking our lives and submitting to things that would numb our senses, like drugs or alcohol, or television, or video games, or these, these square rect rectangles we look at all day and we stare at, you know, we let them control our lives. We let them dictate our lives. We wake up and say, Okay, well, what am I supposed to do when we look at those things and those things dictate who we are? Instead of doing those things, we wake up and we surrender to the Holy Spirit and we pray for this rushing wind to blow through the temple uh, that we are as Christians and say, God, whatever you have us do, I am surrendered to that. What Brother Mike has been preaching says about worship. And it said, in order to worship God in holiness and purity, we have to get rid of the idols in our own lives. In order to be filled with the Holy Spirit, we have to get rid of those idols and make room for Him to live and dwell and, and fill our lives. And then we decorate this surrounding with the Word of God. Now, if you think about this, one of my friends, uh, Rev Wick in, in, in Norfolk, Vermont, he's a chaplain at Norwich University. He would tell his cadets that he would wake up every morning and say, Yes, Lord, what's the question? Yes, Lord, what is the question? That's what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You wake up, you say, God, yes. Now what do you want me to do? I'll do that. You're in control. You call the shots. And as you do that, you also let your, your mind and your life and your spirit be saturated with the Word of God. In Colossians 3.16, it says, Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts of the Lord. I believe there's an intricate connection between being filled with the Spirit and being filled with the Word of God. Letting your life be dictated by what God's Word says, and not what the world's Word says. So this morning, the first way we bring glory to the groom is by being filled with the Spirit. The second way we bring glory to our groom is by speaking and singing His praises. Friends, when we let Christ's words dwell in our hearts, we read it, we meditate on it, it fills our hearts with praise and we worship. Look what Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19 through 21 says. It says, we, speak, we are speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual, spiritual songs, singing and making mel melody in your heart to the Lord. Uh, friends, as you, I was looking at the words here, this includes you know, the, the spoken word, preaching, it includes the psalms, 
hymns, singing, it includes instruments, making a joyful noise. And friends, I, I don't know if you can even carry a tune in the bucket. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. If you're a Christian, you have some way of expressing worship to the Lord through what is coming out of your heart. And it's a joy when the, the church comes together. We're singing. People are jamming up here on the guitar. You know, it's not a show for us. It's up here so that we can direct the, the focus and the, the intentions of our heart on Jesus Christ. Matthew 18, 20 says this, where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Think about all the times worship takes place in the Bible and how many times that worship is together as the body. The nation of Israel will come together to read God's word, to confess their sins, to sing his praise, and all together they will join in and bring glory to their king. And you see the New Testament church, where the Holy Spirit be poured out, and you see miraculous things taking place, where two or three, even in a jail cell, they're singing praises. Friends, we were created to be in this relationship with God, but also to come together as a church to sing and make praise together. When you come to church to worship, is your heart in it? That's why we come together every week. We have something to say. God is good. You know, I don't, I don't care if you can't sing, but you know, you can do this. You can find someone here today on the way out and say, let me just tell you one amazing thing that God has done in my life. Because that's worship. It says here that the, the, the words are spoken, words are sung, and then even uh, later on here, it says in verse 20, giving thanks always for things to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Part of our worship experience is gratitude, saying, God, thank you so much for what you've done in my life. And it's not just singing, it, it's gratitude. And this love song comes from our hearts, saying, God, you've been so good to me. Let me exalt and praise your name. And that worship takes place. Notice, one another, speak to one another in Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Give me things always. You come together, it's the body working together as the body. And we come together to say, God is good. Look at him. Third thing this morning is this. Not only do we bring glory to the groom by being filled by the Holy Spirit and only by singing and speaking his praise. Third thing is this. We bring glory to the groom by submitting to each other and to Christ. Look at verse 21. It says that we submit to one another in the fear of God. One of the biggest blessings of being part of the body of Christ is, is that we have faith. Um, like I mentioned before, when we moved to Huntsville, we needed a church. And you know what? Uh, I'm not a perfect person. I don't know if I met one yet. You know? Your pa pastors aren't perfect. You're not perfect. But we need each other. And there's a command that as we're going to bring glory to Christ, we need to learn that as a church body, part of our responsibility is to submit to one another, to allow us to worship together and to grow together. And this happens in the context of relationships. The Greek word for submit here is the Greek word hypotasso, which means to subject or subordinate. Uh, it basically says, I give you permission to rank under me. If you are in the military or been in the military, you know what it means to subordinate yourself. You might have a commanding officer who ranks above you, and they might not know everything you know, but you have to obey what they say. You intentionally and you purposely say, I'm going to follow what you have to say. And you submit or you subordinate yourself to uh, him. And that's what the scripture is talking about. But it goes beyond uh, just like this ranking thing. It says, listen, I give you permission to get into my life. And friends, that's what we need here in the church. We need to get into each other's lives, into each other's messes, and if you get outside of the mask that we're so easy, easily to wear when we come in and we find the, the seat farthest away from anybody here, you're like, that one right back there. And we hope that if we can sneak in and sneak out and not encounter anybody else, nobody will know that we're messed up on the inside. And friends, that's not being the bride of Christ. The bride of Christ is coming together and saying, listen, I need your help. I can't do this. And so as, and as brothers and sisters of Christ, we confess our sins, we hold one another accountable, and we do what it's talking about here in Ephesians chapter 5, uh, verse 21. We submit to one another in the fear of God, out of reverence for God. I say, I need you in my life. I, I said this in the first service, and I say it again. One thing I've just noticed in the, the, the short month or so that we've been here is that here at Farley Community Church, there's a lot of this. Where there's chairs, a row, nice and neat, and you go through the classrooms and teach up there and all that stuff. And that's good, because we need to learn about God. But 
But I tell you what, community doesn't happen like this. Community happens is when you take those chairs and you put them in the circle, and you look each other in the eyes, and you share your hurts, you share your burdens, you share your joys, and you testify what God is doing in your life, and you live life together. That's where you grow. You don't grow when you sneak in and sneak out and you don't have anybody. We grow when we submit to one another. And that's how it brings glory to, to our group. The second thing is not only do we submit to one another, but we submit to Christ. Because Christ told us to be filled with His Holy Spirit, and He gives us that ability. Christ is the one that we sing to and that we sing our, our love song to, so He is the one who's initiating these things in our life. And so not only do we submit to one another, but we submit to Christ. And Paul gives us a beautiful illustration of this in the context of a, a marital relationship between a husband and a wife. He says, listen, there's a mystery here, but this talks about who God is. Now, I'm going to read this one more time. Most of the times when you hear this in church, it, it, it's someone preaching about how husbands and wives treat each other. But I want you to let me read it again. I want you to focus on what it says about Jesus and his love for his bride. Read along with me here. Verse 22. It says, Why submit to your own husbands as to the Lord? For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church. He is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so that wives be to their own husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but he nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And he says in verse 32, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Friends, this is us. This is our job as the body of Christ to say, as we work with one another, we become a church that brings honor and glory to our group. And real briefly, let me show you this. In order for us to do that, look what Christ, our groom, does for his bride. In verse 23, he leads us as the head. He is the head of the church. Verse 23, he saves us. He's the savior of the church. Verse 25, it talks about how he loves us sacrificially. He sacrificed himself on the cross so that we can be spirit-filled to begin with, so that our sins can be forgiven, so that all the things that hold us hostage, hold us in sin, can be, the power can be broken, and we can be free to worship him in spirit and in truth, all the things that we need are in him, and he accomplished, us, accomplished those things for us on the cross. And then in verse 26 and 27, he talks about this wedding day, how he takes the bride and he sanctifies her, he cleanses her with the washing of the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she should be holy and without blemish. If you're taking notes, write down Revelation 19, verse 7 through 9. John uh, said, writes down this account. He says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was ready to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Church, as the body of Christ, we're getting ready for a celebration. We are supposed to be a church that is ready for her wedding day. And the thing is, so many times we get so focused on things that don't matter, we start focusing on things glory to us. Our job as the bride is to let all that beauty and all that radiance, all that purity that Christ can bring into effect into our lives as a church and say, world, look at us because he is coming. My groom is coming.